this is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome to our second installment in Martial Matters. In the 1830s, the politicians set the policy, often based on the law, the generals set the strategy, their officers implemented the tactics, and the troops, well, they focused on the manual of arms so they could fight as a coherent force. In this episode, we'll look at just what those arms were that they trained with and how, in the right hands, they could have been decisive in the Second Seminole War. This includes the muskets, which every trainee would receive. It includes rifles, which some militia and some regulars received. And it includes the ultimate weapon, a bayonet. We will discuss employment of the bayonet in conjunction with the other two firearms. Who will do this? Jesse Marshall, of course. He returns to us, the autodidact and knowledgeable person of all things Seminole Wars, to explain how these arms were constructed, how they were used, which ones were better than others, and how they affected the course of the Second Seminole War. Jesse, once again, welcome back to the Seminole Wars Authority. Glad to join you. Did the Army's tactics reflect the weapons that they had at hand, or did their weapons reflect the tactics that they felt needed to be employed? The Army's weaponry reflects the tactics. The flintlock musket is an efficient design, but you can't fire it in wet weather or when it's wet. The cartridges are in paper. If the cartridges get wet, that's really what will prevent the thing from firing. A flintlock could fire in the rain as long as there's the sparks from the lock are not damped before they hit the priming powder. But the cartridge itself that's in the ammunition pouch of the soldier is just paper. So if that gets wet, you can't load. So the primary weapon of the infantry of that era was the bayonet, the roughly 16-inch triangular-bladed socket bayonet. fits on the end of the standard musket. It's offset with a shank so that the soldier could still load the musket with the bayonet fixed. But the bayonet is a principal weapon of the infantry because it is with the bayonet that cohesively op functional battle lines of infantry moving in close order could take and hold ground from enemy infantry. In other words, close with the enemy, drive him away or destroy him. That clear game of king of the hill, as it were. So the infantry was trained to look upon the bayonet as a primary weapon. In the Army regulations, the infantry had to keep their bayonets spotlessly bright. Even by 1835, when the Army laid off and said the soldiers polished their muskets too much, there were regulations that men would not polish the barrels mirror bright anymore. It's sufficient that the bayonet mirror bright so that the bayonet would shine or glint of steel with bayonets fixed coming upon an enemy. A very imposing thing to see someone coming at you with the intent of stabbing you, and you can use your weapon to shoot at him, but if the infantryman at the charge can cover a distance of three, four miles an hour, if you're firing at them at a range of 300 yards, once the infantry begins to run, they can close that distance really quickly. If you're armed with muskets that are fouled and you're only being able to fire one or two rounds a minute, they might close with you in that time. There's a fight-or-flight response. Now, as you say, a bayonet affixed to a musket gave the soldier much greater reach in both the offense and defense than just the bladed weapon in his hand, which is what the Seminole had. How great of a, pardon the expression, edge did this give the soldiers? Paul Foster, in his papers published some years ago and edited by John and Mary Lou Missile, describes that circumstance. Seminoles had tomahawks, that's true, but most of the accounts of using them are to finish somebody off that they've already stricken down. We had the Dades battle when the war began, when the second attack of the Seminoles, once the troops had built a little triangular breastwork and raised it knee high or so. Seminoles attacked again. Private Clark says they formed a perimeter around the breastwork that was essentially the range of their rifle. So you see the Seminoles, if they could, they would make sure that they didn't allow the troops to close any closer to them than their own rifle range, where they could strike the troops, but where the inaccurate muskets would not have advantage and bayonets certainly wouldn't have any advantage. So you see the desperation of the troops to close on the Seminole. That occasion came at Okeechobee, where they came the closest to doing so. And according to Kawakuchi, quoted in 1848 by Dante's break, that he was forced to retire when the troops pressed on them so hard they couldn't even load their guns. Well, you see what that means is that they're loading their guns behind the trees, and they fire, and they had to run because they perceived that if they reloaded their guns, by the time they were reloaded, the troops would have been upon them with bayonets. 
What was the government's position on whether the called-up militia had the requisite training and skills or not? The U.S. government was aware that the militia of the United States generally was already conversant with rifle and light infantry tactics, that they weren't necessarily the perfect force to train as a heavy infantry force, although they would have to provide the bulk of the heavy infantry in wartime. But there was a recognition that they already had, being country hunters in many cases, the ability to act as light infantry in action with a minimum of training. So there was purchases in large numbers of military rifles by the federal government that could be utilized by the militia and federal service. These included what was called the common rifle. That was a standard muzzle-loading rifle design called the Harpers Ferry rifle or Harpers Ferry Jaeger rifle of 1803, also a pattern of 1814, which was similar. And then the final version of that was produced in 1817. And between those three models, there were quite a few of those rifles in, in federal arsenals that would have been issued to U.S. militia and volunteer units in active service. But also, in 1819, the federal government adopted the Hall's rifle. It was a rifle caliber arm that was a breech loader. It was a flintlock. It had a flip-up breech where the soldier could load it from the breech. The advantage of it was that with the common rifle to load it, the ball in a rifle had to fit very tightly in the bore in order to be spun by the rifling when it was fired. And so... You had to use two hands to force the ball down into the barrel when you're loading it. And that's with a grease patch over the ball to lubricate it and to seal it. And that got worse because after every shot with a rifle, the powder fouling would fill the barrel and make it even more difficult to ram the ball down. So you'd have to wipe the barrel out after every couple, optimally after every shot, but after every two or three shots, you certainly have to wipe the barrel out. With the Hall's rifle, because it's a breech loader, that fouling issue was abated because you simply flipped the breech up and inserted the ball and then used a special powder horn to fill the chamber, and you closed the breech and you primed it like a standard front lock and you aimed and fired. Well, the soldier armed with the Hall's rifle would not have had to expose it. He wouldn't have had to stand up to reload. You could have fired it while you're lying on the ground or while you're kneeling, and you wouldn't have had to move to alter your position in order to load efficiently. Thirdly, the Hall's rifle, because it was a breech loader, could fit a socket bayonet on the end of it. Because since a rifle, a common rifle, you had these two hands to force the ball down with the ramrod, you couldn't have a bayonet fitted on the end of it. It would have been in the way. But since the Hall rifle fires from the breech, they could fit a bayonet on it. So the Hall rifle was a game changer. It was the first real attempt of the U.S. military to combine the infantry with the riflemen and unfortunately the halls was not a success because to the degree that it was employed in active service in the creek war of 1836 and the florida war it was found inefficient the powder if it was carried loaded which was frequently the case the seal uh, between the breech mechanism and the barrel was not perfect powder would sift out of the powder chamber and down underneath the stock and sometimes when the soldier would fire it, that powder underneath the stock would blow the stock out. That evidently happened frequently. The mechanism would rust if the soldier didn't clean it every night, and it's difficult to clean. That was another problem. So it wasn't soldier-proof. In fact, the U.S. Dragoons were armed with hull carbines. These were a shorter version of the hull. Same breech mechanism. Their other advantage being that they were percussion. They fired a percussion cap so that the Dragoon did not have to prime with a powder horn. He just put a percussion cap on the cone under the hammer so that theoretically he could reload it even when he was on horseback without a lot of trouble. But even the Dragoons disliked the hull's carbine because... They found that it was easily gotten out of order in the swamps. And what we find is references that dragoon units on patrol in Florida frequently just carried standard muskets because they found two things. The musket rarely misfired, and secondly, the musket could fire buckshot, which was the most effective ammunition in many views against the Seminoles who usually were hidden in the bushes. The federal government relied on militia call-ups. How did they help the states with those call-ups? The federal government did provide to the states a certain quantity of ordnance annually based on the number of enrolled militia, but the majority of the Hull's rifles that were purchased for the Ordnance Department were stocked in federal arsenals and were issued to militia and 
volunteer units in federal service. There were exceptions. Evidently, Captain Washington's company of the 4th Artillery Regiment at one point in 1837 was acting as a mounted company, and they used Hall's rifles while they acted in a mounted capacity. They were also carried by Captain Jernigan's company of Georgia Mounted Volunteers in the Creek War of 1836 and used to some advantage in the fighting that that company had in central Georgia. Some of the Tennessee units at Wallace Swamp evidently had the halls, supposedly. I've also seen reference to muskets among some of the companies. The general consensus seems to have been that by 1840, they recognized that it was not the perfect arm for field use. It was too liable to being put out of order, and they felt that it would have been a much better arm for fortress defense where it wouldn't have been subjected to field conditions and if used by Marines and naval vessels. So by 1840-41, the purchase of the Hall's weapons was largely confined to the carbines for dragoons, and those were generally found functional, if not perfect. There were upgrades in the carbine design into the 1840s, though. The Halls being the latest, greatest rifle, General Scott certainly wanted his troops to have it, and of course was chagrined when he couldn't get all of them to have it. In 1836, he was excited to bring his army of Florida with all its volunteer units into the field with the best possible modern weapons, and Again, the Hall's rifle pattern of 1819 would have combined the bayonet-armed soldier of the infantry with the capability of firing aimed rifle fire at a rapid rate, and so this is a big deal. And Scott was infuriated to find out that the southern arsenals, which were the ones from which he was, of course, going to draw the bulk of the supplies for his army, those arsenals didn't have any Hall's rifles in them, and he was really ticked about that. So he says in his correspondence, I'm going to have to arm them all with common muskets, which even he knew was a disadvantage for units that were only going to be in active duty for three months. They were not going to perfect the use of these basic infantry arms. In other words, they had to act as light infantry, which was infantry armed troops that acted in a light manner, but that decreased the lethality of their gunfire markedly because the musket did not have sights. It was not designed to shoot at individual targets. No, the the musket is not rifled, but the Halls was. It was a rifle. The musket is, the Halls had fixed sights, iron sights. They were non adjustable. Well, they were very, pretty much the same as on the common rifles of the era. The federal arsenals in the South were going to supply the bulk of the equipage to these federalized militia of the South and these volunteer units. For each musket, there should be one set of accoutrements, complete. Cartridge boxes, bayonet scabbard belts, and everything. Scott was really put out to find that most of these accoutrements were surplus from the War of 1812 that had been stockpiled over 20 years earlier. In many cases, some of it was even older, and a lot of it was in really bad condition. When you're marching around a swamp with paper cartridges, it's really important that your cartridge box, your ammo pouch, as we'd call it, was in good condition. They're made of leather. They usually had a painted linen flap on the inside to keep rain off of the top of the cartridges. There's a wooden block that the cartridges sit in on the inside. Well, those cartridge boxes in good condition would keep the ammo dry unless you immerse the box. Well, when you have a 25-year-old cartridge box of a poor design, not the most modern, but a really bad design, not even then in a good condition, the likelihood of the ammunition being spoiled has increased. Scott was upset about that. What he did do is he borrowed equipment from the state of South Carolina. He wrote Governor McDuffie of South Carolina and he says, I need to borrow a large quantity of accoutrements and canteens, knapsacks, anything you've got in your militia arsenals, your state arsenals. And Scott was able to promise Governor McDuffie that anything we use, we will replace with brand new federal production. Governor McDuffie, of course, acceded. What became of that equipment? Was it recycled, refurbished, turned in, kept in place? The guns and accoutrements and equipage that Scott's army carried to Florida didn't leave. When the volunteers were mustered out after three months, they left that equipage in Florida. And to stockpile it, a couple of ordnance depots were built, one at Tampa Bay and one at Gary's Ferry on Black Creek off of St. John's. And those ordnance depots stockpiled the thousands of muskets and old accoutrements. And when new volunteer units were being organized for Florida service in subsequent years, frequently they would be brought into the field unarmed and then they would be equipped from those Florida ordnance depots. 
There were exceptions. The Missouri Volunteers were organized so far away in mid-1837 that there's references that they drew equipment and rifles from the St. Louis Federal Arsenal before they proceeded down the Mississippi River to Florida. All right, if they drew the halls, what type of manual of arms did they have for it? And could they integrate it into the tactics, Scott's tactics, more easily? The hall, there was a specific manual of arms for it because it was a little bit of a clunky design. The skirmish drill and rifle drill of even Scott's tactics stated that in action, riflemen and light infantry carried their guns however they saw fit. It wasn't really a concern outside of parade how they handled their weapons. Whereas the regular infantry that would have fought shoulder to shoulder in close order, in those cases, the infantryman would have to handle his weapons to the specific manual of arms in order not to jostle or crowd his file partners and the men on his left and right. Of course, in Florida, those heavy infantry units had to fight as light infantry anyway because of the broken terrain. Again, the Hall's rifle, as advanced as it was, soldiers didn't like it because the breech chamber would frequently rust in place and they would have wouldn't have the tools really to dismount the whole rifle in order to clean the breech mechanism to get the moving parts functioning again. Jesse, you've described how the halls is constructed and used, but we really haven't gone into how the musket is constructed. Is it very difficult? What's the uh, process with that? It's basically a tube mounted on a wooden stock with a very simple mechanism of spring clockwork to drop the hammer with the flint in it against a striker to make it spark and fire the powder off. So there's very few moving parts in it unless there was some physical injury to the exterior of the arm. They don't really need maintenance other than cleaning. And the musket, if it did misfire, you just reprimed it and kept trying. And it was easy to unload even if it wouldn't fire. They had a little screwdriver-like appendage called a ball puller that would screw on the threaded end of their ramrod and they could push it down in the barrel and they could, since the musket and rifle balls were soft lead, they could use that ball puller to turn that screw into the ball and pull the ball without having to fire the gun. I've seen relics dug at fort sites where they have the screw hole in them where the soldiers had pulled them rather than fired them, either because the gun was misfiring or because they were coming off guard duty or something like that, where the commanders didn't want them to fire the piece off, so they just pull the ball and pour the powder out. The Hall's rifle, like all the rifles, used loose powder. The common rifles were loaded with a horn or flask that was filled with powder, and the Hall's rifle, at least in the 1830s, was principally loaded by means of a special powder flask. So they didn't necessarily use the paper fixed cartridges like for the musket and that meant that the rifleman had to take some care in handling the the horn and the flask in terms of the quantity of powder that he put they charged into the barrel if he overcharged the barrel with powder the ball would strip in other words it would fly through the rifling grooves without spinning it would just shred the edges of the ball literally off and so we lose accuracy and if you undercharge the charge in the barrel with the rifle using your horn, etc. you lose accuracy and range in that effect as well. So you had to take care in loading the rifles. And the Hall's rifle is intended to prevent that and make it easier because the Hall's special loading flask had a powder and a ball end on it. Looks like kind of a little toy gumball machine on a strap, cylindrical, and it has spouts on either end. And one of them, you hit the spring thumb catch and it would drop the ball almost like a gumball out of it and push it into the chamber. And then you reverse the flask and you insert the spout and then you push the thumb catch until the chamber of the holes is filled. And then you close the breech and fired it you wouldn't have to really manually measure the quantity of powder that you needed to pour into the bore to load it. So what was the problem? The Halls had all these benefits. Why wasn't it adopted as the Army rifle? The Halls was a really marvelous design, excellent idea. The manufacture and execution of them was well done for the era, but it just didn't prove to be suitable as a combat weapon. The musket may not have had the accuracy, but more reliable. The soldiers would have required a lot less training or instruction in their maintenance 
they were no more complex than a common country man's hunting gun. Whereas the Hall rifle, as a breech-loading weapon, had was really, really unique and interesting. Even a sportsman that might have entered the service for the Florida campaigns, if he's given a Hall rifle, he's going to have to be shown how it functions. And if you gave him a common rifle of U.S. make, it wouldn't be would like, all right, you know, I get it. Or even a musket, which is essentially just a shotgun that fired a big slug. It didn't take any real training to understand how to use them. When the individual soldier or militiaman or whoever, you hand him a musket and he looks at it, he's going to say, okay, it's got a big barrel, it has no rifling, and there are no sights. So it's essentially a shotgun. And then when he sees his cartridges, he sees they're ball cartridges with a big .65 caliber ball. So he says, okay, we're firing slugs. In Florida, the Army liked to issue buck and ball cartridges, which had another three thirty caliber buckshot tied on top of the ball. And so this the guy would say, okay, it's even more like a shotgun. It fires a big slug and three buckshot. So it wasn't produced any confusion in its operation and maintenance. So what was its operation like once the soldier pulled the trigger? Imagine two rounds a minute, the line of men, 100 strong, firing two rounds a minute. That's 200 rounds a minute into a zone of 100 yards or so. The rate of fire is significant. The one thing that was not controllable is the leveling of that fire. In 20th century squad tactics, the AR team handling the BAR in World War II and then the M60 by the Vietnam War, the AR team, the gunner and his assistant, they are being very specifically managed. Usually the assistant squad leader in the drills from World War II era would specifically pay attention to the AR team and where it was putting its fire. Well, that was impossible in the early 19th century. If you have 100 men in line and they're all firing at once, which is about as close as you can get to that similarity of fire, but you can't control the elevation and traverse of each man's fire. And so while it's analogous to the rate of fire of a machine gun, it's, it's a lot more scattered more like a shotgun, if you imagine. And I know that machine gun fire is more like shotgun fire than, say, a sewing machine. But if we use that poor illusion, we would say that musketry, while it could deliver a machine gun level of fire into a given area, the fire would have been much more irregular in terms of accuracy than, say, a single machine gun. So that's it. The Army just told its soldiers, suck it up. You're not getting marksmanship training. Do your best. There was a change in the late 1830s. There was a demand, a general order even put out to provide more musketry training. But there was the early 1840s, a comment that by an army inspector mentioned the troops at some post that the men couldn't hit a basic mark. So they didn't really enforce even what musketry training they intended to have. It was not universally enforced. We do know that later in the 19th century, the Army had a much better means of producing marksmanship training by offering the specific badges and medals for marksmanship qualification. By 1898, any American soldier that had achieved excellence with the handling of his rifle got to wear the special marksmanship tabs on his uniform collar, for example. Something you see in old photographs reminds me in some sense to the enthusiasm of Korean War riflemen to wear their combat infantry badges after that insignia was available to them. I have a Korean War veteran friend and he has lots of snapshots. It's interesting to see the riflemen in the trenches and their fatigues wearing their CIBs. And it reminds me of seeing the U.S. Army marksman qualified infantry of the Indian Wars era of the 1880s wearing their marksmanship badges on their fatigue blouses 67 years earlier. Well, there was none of that. There were no medals for anything in the U.S. Army of the 1820s and 30s. And again, the bayonet was considered the principal means of taking and holding ground. You could fire at your enemies all day, but it wouldn't change anything. How many men were killed and wounded? There was no real evidence in the doctrinal mind's eye of that era, especially after the Napoleonic Wars, that small arms fire was capable of driving a well-disciplined enemy infantry force from a piece of property. You had to drive them off with a bayonet. So regular army being a small cadre of sorts, and particularly one that was designed to master the Europeans' art of war. That seems to have been their primary emphasis, is instilling a sense of discipline that was necessary to have bayonet-armed infantry carry through infantry attacks. But they did against the Indians, and it did work. Not firing the musket or the rifle, whether because one was charging with a bayonet on the end, or some other reasons, 
seems to have stayed with the soldier for decades and decades and decades. Perhaps that's an example of you can change the technology, but you can't change the soldier. S.L.A. Marshall posited in his book, Men Against Fire, that in World War II and perhaps early in Korea, the American riflemen on the skirmish lines in France in World War II, they didn't use their rifles as much as they should have, that the crew served weapons ended up being the main dependence including the BAR, which was essentially a crew served because it had an ammunition carrier along with the gunner, but the 30 caliber machine gun in its section and the riflemen supporting them, but the riflemen not necessarily using their weapons to great advantage. Well, we could probably translate the same incidents to a lot of these wilderness skirmishes in Florida or the Southeast generally, where you take any unit, whether it's militia or regulars, and you scatter them in the woods. They have no crew-served weapons unless they happen to have an artillery piece, which was frequently the case as it dates battle or in the Battle of San Flasco Hammock. There was a Florida militia battalion supported by a 12-pounder howitzer commanded by a company of regulars. In battles like that, we see that the troops usually perform relatively well. At Dade's battle, the troops were credited with as an elite of military skill, essentially dying on the ground, manning that cannon. Then we have San Velasco, which is more successful, where the Florida troops, with that artillery piece aiding them, fought a pretty stand-up fight against a few hundred Seminoles and came out the victors. And the Florida troops, even though they weren't very well disciplined, were capable of winning some of these skirmishes. But it was never a guarantee, because you can find references where the Seminoles would ambush parties of Georgia and Florida militia even into the early 1840s, and it was never a guarantee of who would win. Whereas any time the Seminoles would ambush any large number of regular troops, it was like kicking a hornet's nest. The regular troops would have counterattacked generally. An ambush would have charged into the bushes with bayonets fixed and you know, driven them, or worse, might have even bayoneted them if they got the chance. A bayonet affixed to a musket gave the soldier much greater reach in both the offense and defense than just the bladed weapon in his hand, which is what the Seminole had. How great of a, pardon the expression, edge did this give the soldiers? You could fire at your enemies all day, but it wouldn't change anything. How many men were killed and wounded? There was no real evidence in the doctrinal mind's eye of that era, especially after the Napoleonic Wars, that small arms fire was capable of driving a well-disciplined enemy infantry force from a piece of property. You had to drive them off with a bayonet. So regular army being a small cadre of sorts, and particularly one that was designed to master the Europeans' art of war, that seems to have been their primary emphasis is instilling a sense of discipline that was necessary to have bayonet-armed infantry carry through infantry attacks. That's what they did against the Indians, and it did work. Jesse, we began with my question about do the firearms inform the tactics or the tactics inform the firearms? And what we see is the army that began the war ended the war with pretty much the same weapons, but they adapted the tactics for actual practical use. Scott's Tactics. The first edition came out in 1815. He then issued an updated and modified version in 1825, and then he produced his final variant in 1835. The 1835 version remained in print through the Civil War. There were editions published in the early 1840s, and they might have even had a few corrections but because it was the standard tactics of the Army from 1835 to 1857 and was widely used by volunteer units on both sides in the war between the states, it was a long-running tactical system. It was actually replaced officially in the U.S. Army in 1857 by Hardy's tactics, which was a light infantry system entirely. I mean, that's a whole nother ball of wax, but I'll just say this. If the public has the impression that the armies of the Civil War fought the battles in heavy infantry style, they're mistaken, because both armies were essentially training with the rifle and light infantry tactics that was produced by Hardy based on the French rifle and light infantry system. How close was it to the French tactical manuals of the day? It's by and large a duplicate of the French original, and the French had written that manual for chasseurs and zouaves, particularly from experience in fighting tribesmen in North Africa in the 1830s and 40s. But the 
U.S. Army Officer Corps in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s recognized that a light infantry drill was the correct one for their circumstances. In fact, reading records from the war with Mexico, one frequently will find reference to the troops making their attacks in skirmish order or light order through chaparral, through the broken terrain. Well, we have a myriad of fanciful art prints showing the U.S. troops in strong columns and Napoleonic battle lines. Specific descriptions are they're frequently fighting the Mexicans in light infantry order, and they're out west. By adopting Hardy tactics in 1857, or ordering that it be used by all foot troops from that time, the War Department was recognizing that there was no particular need for the heavy infantry drill because the Europeans had by and large abandoned it, particularly after creating the advantage of the rifled musket, where every infantryman was now a rifleman. The rifle musket became dominant in Europe in the 1850s and the United States kept pace, so the heavy infantry was no longer really needed. Unfortunately, Civil War movies and reenactments give the impression, I fear too much so, that the armies of the Civil War, just because they were in lines, doesn't mean they weren't light infantry. They weren't marching into combat quite like Frederick the Great. The units were drilled to move those battle lines at the double quick, at quick time, double quick, and at the run. And that was essentially necessary because with rifled arms being common, for example, a common British infield had a rear sight that was graduated up to almost a 1,000 yards. The farther you're firing at a target, you're aiming the gun higher. You're elevating the barrel. So that means the trajectory of the bullet is more arced, and it means that it's coming down to where it's going to strike the ground, say, at an increasing arc at long range. Without going into too great a detail, the longer the range, the less the dangerous space. The dangerous space would be where the bullet in coming down to the ground would pass just over the head of one man and then behind him would land at the feet of another without striking either of them. Dangerous space is the ground between them where the bullet would hit somebody between those two guys, say. So you see... By adopting light infantry tactics as standard, the units were trained to move with immense celerity in combat so that an enemy would have great difficulty zeroing in their rifle fire. Jesse, you said that they continued to update Scott's tactics every five years or ten years or so, and that the book was continuously used as the tactical manual up to about 1857. Then what happened? What replaced it? How was it different? And again, did the firearms, because they were more advanced in the Civil War, affect the tactics that were used, or did the tactics adapt to the firearms? We see that in the massive scale of the organization for war on both sides, that there were frequently regiments of Union or Confederate infantry, which were, again, identically organized, that some companies would be armed with older muskets, sometimes even still in the flintlock, but more often converted to percussion in the 1850s or 60s. It actually was happening before the war broke out. 1857 or 58, the War Department required all U.S. Army foot troops to train by the light infantry and rifle tactics translated from the French by William J. Hardy of the Army, subsequently a Confederate Corps commander during the war. But Hardy's tactics were standard for both sides in the war. We tend to think of the Civil War armies being Napoleonic, Again, doing that dance of sorts of columns and lines sweeping across the plains at a steady tread. The reality was that these were armies trained by a system of light infantry tactics and armed with rifle muskets, although many of them were armed with smoothbores as well. But the advantage they had in any case was the light infantry drills, particularly they were using, allowed for maneuvers with the men moving at double time or even at a run. A popular reference to those tactics were Shanghai drill, in other words, something akin to a Chinese fire drill. So at reenactments and in movies, we see these solid columns and ranks lumbering about. That's somewhat accurate to a degree, but the intent of Hardy's tactics and those tactics they were using by the time generally was that under fire, the units could move with incredible celerity. And the reason that was necessary comes back to those adjustable rear sights on the common rifle musket. 
if you are in a column advancing against an enemy position, say the round tops at Gettysburg, and you're a Confederate battalion commander, and you know that within 500 yards, the enemy can open an accurate fire into your column. And if they do open that fire at 500 yards, there's an advantage because you can then have your men move at the double quick to close that distance. And in the time it takes the enemy to readjust their sight, they can't deliver an accurate fire necessarily. And perhaps the flank companies would have the rifled guns, if any. But by the end of the war, both armies were largely armed, at least the field armies, with the newer rifle musket, either the Springfield pattern or British-made infield rifle muskets, pattern of 1853. So the distinction was no longer of importance. And indeed, large numbers of Union troops by the end of the war were being outfitted with even superior arms, like the Henry 16-shot lever-action repeating rifle, which proved itself to be an amazing combat weapon in Battle of Atlanta and other actions. The U.S. Army adopted breech-loading Springfield rifles, which increased the rate of fire even more. There were complaints about the Springfield trapdoor, as they called the post-Civil War breech loaders, that they could be gotten out of order in a sort of way, that the brass cartridge case could swell and jam the mechanism. But the hall didn't have that problem since it didn't use a cartridge of any kind. It certainly seemed more robust, and the technology, the Civil War certainly gave the federal government the finances to work out a great deal of the technological issues. Tell us about how they're manufactured. I wouldn't claim to be an expert about weapons manufacturing. Uh, There are firearms enthusiasts galore and marvelous books on these subjects. If I may, I'd give you an anecdote that gives you an idea and, and one that I find more amusing personally. There was a farmer in Virginia in the 1850s, and he heard of a new invention called a sewing machine. And he saw a woodcut in a newspaper showing a sewing machine that used a needle to automatically sew cloth together with thread and he worked for a year puzzling in his mind as he worked his farm how on earth such a machine could possibly function he's never seen a sewing machine didn't know anything about them but he ended up building a wooden one and he figured out he watched his wife darning socks one day and he figured out how it was possible to make a sewing machine watching his wife mechanically move her fingers with the darning needle So he designed a single needle, single thread sewing machine, which he subsequently marketed. He found a manufacturer in the north, and I believe it was Brown and Sharp, New England, said, yes, we can manufacture these in metal after you build a wooden model. And they did a little bit of improvement, and it took them, if I'm not mistaken, almost two years to build the tooling to manufacture these little Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machines in the late 1850s. In the meantime, the kind farmer was a little bit put out because he thought sewing machines were a flash in the pan and two years going by, it wasn't going to mount to anything. Brown and Sharp, those mechanics, they were merciless in their determination to have the tooling be It's one thing to turn out anything from a clock to a gun. You could hand make anything, and you could hand make it to a level of expertise that's amazing. But there was a different factor at work in America in the pre-Civil War years, and it was anyone could make this thing. The farmer made a wooden sewing machine, but we're going to make tooling that will make thousands of these machines and will make them run perfectly. And it took them almost two years of dedicated effort in one little factory to make the tooling alone. And in fact, the tooling for those little sewing machines, they proved to be a big hit. And those sewing machines were manufactured through the late 1940s with the same 90 plus years of that same tooling turning out that technology. So imagine that sort of incredible effort being dedicated toward weapons technology. And it was being dedicated toward it because there was federal money involved. And even where there was no federal money, you have Sam Colt and his Colt Patterson's arms, which he did try to market to the government somewhat unsuccessfully, but he had enough encouragement to keep going. And by 1860, his revolvers were sort of a standard, and they became a standard during and after the Civil War. Was this similar in any way to the German needle gun? Not particularly. The German needle gun used a sort of firing pin. It was a bolt-action gun. If I'm not mistaken, it used something like a paper cartridge, but it had a firing pin. In other words, the percussion cap was mounted inside the rear of the cartridge, and a firing pin was 
released by pulling the trigger after the gun was loaded. I believe it was called the Dry's Needle Rifle, as some referred to it. The French, by 1870, had adopted the, I believe it was the Chespo, a similar rifle in the arms race on the continent. But the Germans proved more successful in the War of 1870, capturing Paris, etc. The United States is watching this with interest. We had, in the meantime, adopted the breech-loading, single-shot Springfield so-called trapdoor rifle and its carbine short barrel equivalent for cavalry, those arms are standard from 1870 or so uh, through the war with Spain. Just prior to the war with Spain, we adopted a magazine rifle, the Krag Jorgensen. It was a bolt action rifle. It had an internal box magazine. I can't remember its capacity, five or six rounds. It was a 30 caliber, fired a metal cartridge. The disadvantage to it was that it couldn't be loaded with a clip. You open the side of the magazine and you hand-loaded the cartridges in it one at a time. You could fire the crag single shot by turning the magazine off and retaining the magazine as a, a reserve. And then you could turn the magazine on and fire those five or six shots in rapid succession if you had to. Well... In combat in the war with Spain in 1898, particularly in Cuba, the American regulars, particularly who were armed with the Krag, found that they were at a great disadvantage. The Spanish infantrymen were armed with five-shot German pattern Spanish Mausers, pattern of 1893. They were loaded with a five-shot clip. In other words, you open the breech and you jam the five-round clip in and you fire the five shots. Meanwhile, the American GIs, once they fire the magazine of their crag, they're essentially single shooting it. There was actually many American units, particularly volunteer National Guard units in Cuba, after the fighting ended, who were re-equipped with captured Spanish Mausers. The Army, by the 1870s, 80s, they even adopted marksmanship badges for wear even on the fatigue uniform of the regular troops. The National Rifle Association, if I'm not mistaken, found it around. 1870 71 by union veterans there was a vast interest in so-called rifle clubs and a mania for target shooting throughout the united states after the civil war and the national rifle association promoted these clubs to a great degree and obviously one of the ideas behind it was that an infantry force that was capable of delivering a sustained and accurate fire would have the greater advantage by far of course, the enemy is always working up their own ideas as well, and the mania for accuracy did not prove to be advantageous in the First World War, for example, where independent rifle firing proved to be valuable in individual cases, particularly that of Sergeant York, but in a war in which machine guns with interlocking fields of fire were the dominant ground weapon, the individual marksmanship capability of the rifleman didn't really come into play quite as often as it would have 30 years earlier. The Kalashnikov series of Soviet-designed assault weapons, not as accurate generally than the American AR series. There's a great deal of bureaucratic elements. There's fascinating political intrigue, corporate warfare, and everything else going on regarding the small arms of the U.S. military because that's a very important contract. One can see the value of it. Uh, I go back to about 15 years ago, an episode of Nova about Lockheed and Boeing going at each other's throats over the next generation fighter. And I'd imagine that when the military finds that it needs an upgrade in small arms, that the competition is probably equally, if not more fierce. Because the fighter planes, they might wear out after 10 years, but as we've seen with the M1 Grand, which was common from 1940 through the 50s, and the AR series of weapons common from the mid-60s through today. How did soldiers pass along lessons learned from weapons usage in battles? You have two levels of lessons learned. You have the unrecorded legend of the regular army, the sort of campfire tales passed from generation to generation of officers in the regular army. In fact, Douglas MacArthur mentioned in the 1920s that the story of Day's battlefield was a campfire story when he was a West Point cadet. So these lessons learned were, if not in official documents, they were passed on informally. But even among the militia, you had that. The militia of the South, even in the 1830s, 40s, and even after the Civil War, and many country people were eminently familiar either with the Battle of Kings Mountain, if you were on the east side of the Chattahoochee River, and if you're on the west side, then you knew or knew of someone that knew a veteran of the Battle of New Orleans. 
these campfire tales. You had legends like Sam Dale, who in the Creek War, in a hand-to-hand battle with several Creeks, came out the winner and became a legend, largely for surviving by the skin of his teeth, by the way. Evidently, there were plenty of witnesses, so unlike a lot of Colonel Crockett's far-flung adventures, most of which, of course, he didn't write, um, these, these tall tales, the Sam Dale canoe fight, as it was called, appears essentially to have been recorded somewhat accurately. So Sam Dale was a legend in frontier Alabama that many young men would have heard the tales of the canoe fight. Lessons learned was largely confined to these sort of campfire stories and folk legends, evidently. The regular army level and then at the militia level, you had sort of folk tales. Since the militia was the armed populace and the, they had their favorites, Francis Marion in the swamps, Battle of Kings Mountain, the Creek War in general, a vast host of, of frontiersmen, Tennesseans principally, and Georgians under Jackson against the Creeks, and then a similar force at the Battle of New Orleans defeating the British. Jesse Marshall, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Yes, it's been a pleasure. This podcast is copyright 2022. The Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.